Hello, everyone. Uh, today we are discussing the question of Holy Week or the issue of Holy Week and proper liturgies. It's entitled, This is the Night. That phrase, this is a, the night, actually comes from the Book of Common Prayer, from the great vigil of Easter, uh, when we all say together, this is the night when you brought our fathers and the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt and led them through the Red Sea on dry land. It's a wonderful season uh, that we are about to enter with Palm Sunday, uh, this coming Sunday, uh, and then we'll run through the great vigil of Easter on Saturday evening and then culminating in Easter Sunday. This, uh, in this lesson, I want to talk about the, the, the question of why we have Holy Week at all. Uh, why is it so important? Why is this the culmination of the, the Christian calendar? And I also want to talk about where it came from and why it's so important to, to observe uh, Holy Week. I'd like to start by uh, imagining that we can roll back the clock and imagine ourselves in the time of the earliest Christians uh, shortly after the death and the resurrection of Christ. Um, Christianity faced a daunting challenge uh, in the first century. How do you create a faith community and ensure its survival for centuries, even for generations? Unlike Judaism, which is a family religion, Christianity is not a matter of who, uh, you, who you are or where you were born. If you're a Jew, membership in the Jewish community is automatic upon birth. But contrast that with Christianity, which is not tied to any particular race or ethnicity, nationality, or language. No one is technically born a Christian, even though people may talk about being cradle Episcopalians or cradle Catholics. The truth is, uh, Christianity is a choice, and it's also very multicultural, and it was from the very beginning. And so the early disciples faced a question, how do you inculcate faith? Uh, how do you pass it on uh, intergenerationally across ethnic uh, boundaries and language boundaries and cultural boundaries? The early Christians learned something very important from Jesus and from his disciples. And that is that you don't just become a Christian by learning its doctrines, its dogmas, its teachings, but you actually learn Jesus himself. Uh, there's a very interesting and even strange verse in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 20. Paul is rather put out with uh, the Christians in Ephesus because of their misconduct and somewhat like in, in, in uh, anxiety or exasperation, he just says, this is not the way you learn Jesus. He says, you were taught in him. What's interesting about that phrase is it doesn't say this is not how you learned about Jesus, but it's, he actually says this is how you learned Jesus. Uh, I'm going to give you a little Greek word here that will sort of uh, convey this idea to you. I'll try to put this on the screen right now. Um, give me a moment. So how do you learn Jesus? And so Paul says in Ephesians 4.20, this is not the way you learned Christ. You were taught in him. The phrase learned is actually from the Greek manthano, and it means literally to learn by practice or experience, to acquire by custom or habit, to fully comprehend something, to fully understand it. The early Christians developed the notion that was really not unusual in the ancient world is that the best way to learn something is to learn by doing it, to learn it experientially. Uh, so for the early Christians, uh, becoming a disciple of Christ was not primarily an academic subject. You don't learn Jesus like you learn geometry or learn history. We would probably make a pretty big distinction between, um, say, learning about Abraham Lincoln and actually learning Abraham Lincoln. I used to teach Shakespeare, and I would teach students 
about Shakespeare, but I never claim you're going to actually become <laughs> Shakespeare or learn Shakespeare, uh, the person. Uh, rather, in the, in the Christian model, uh, we actually take on uh, the life of Christ in some way, in some powerful way. This is argued over and over again in scripture and illustrated in scripture. Uh, in fact, it's the very idea of, of being a disciple. A disciple is someone who actually follows a person and becomes like them in some way. And so in the ancient church, the idea was that through a whole range of practices and habits, through scripture reading and prayer and communal worship, uh, the practices of baptism and the Eucharist, uh, we learn about Christ and we ultimately learn him uh, in a very in particular and intimate way. Uh, if you think about it, one of the functions of the Christian calendar that we are very much aware of during Holy Week is an attempt to walk the life of Jesus annually uh, through the, uh, the, the calendar year, through the liturgical year, I should say. And so when we practice Lent, as we are currently practicing it, we are uh, spiritually and in a kind of experiential way, entering into Jesus' Jesus's 40 days uh, in the wilderness. Uh, Palm Sunday, uh, we walk the path with him as he makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On Maundy Thursday, coming up next week, we go to the table with him and we wash each other's feet as he did. We enter into his suffering on Good Friday, at the cross, uh, we experience the silence and the somberness of Holy Saturday, and that prepares us for the great vigil of Easter uh, that uh, allows us to enjoy and celebrate his uh, resurrection. Where did this idea come from of the Christian calendar, uh, observing Holy Week, uh, experiencing Lent? I wanted to share a story about a, a very unusual person who is not really well known to us, but uh, I hope uh, you'll enjoy learning about her a bit. Uh, her name is Egeria, and I have a screen for you about Egeria here, if I can find it, just a moment. Um, Egeria was a woman who lived in, uh, uh, in uh, the western part of Europe in about the fourth century. Uh, she may have been from what is now considered Spain uh, or perhaps even Gaul or what became known as uh, France in our times. Uh, Egeria must have been a fairly well-to-do person uh, because she was able to travel make a pilgrimage to uh, the Holy Land uh, that uh, lasted for about three years. Uh, she traveled to Egypt, to Alexandria. She traveled to Constantinople, what is now Istanbul and modern day Turkey. Uh, she spent time in Syria and she spent a fair amount of time in Jerusalem. Uh, this is around 381, 384. Uh, and she kept notes. Her she had a travel log that she kept and told the story of what it was like to be in Jerusalem, especially uh, during what we call Holy Week. She observed, for example, that Christians in Jerusalem in the fourth century would walk out to the Mount of Olives uh, on Palm Sunday, and they would walk and make the journey from the Mount of Olives down into uh, Jerusalem. And then they would observe various events during Holy Week, uh, not unlike what we do, and uh, uh, leading up to, uh, of course, uh, the Easter uh, vigil and the Easter service. Uh, Egeria recorded this in meticulous detail, uh, and in time, what was practiced in Jerusalem, as described by Egeria, it was passed on uh, to other churches in uh, the Mediterranean world, and eventually the practices of Holy Week uh, became common uh, throughout uh, the Christian world. 
By the 17th century, even new kinds of practices are beginning to emerge. For example, many of you uh, know about the Stations of the Cross, walking the 14 steps of Jesus on, on Good Friday, where you can meditate at each of these stations uh, and reflect on Christ's sufferings on our behalf uh, going to the cross. Um, that was a later development, much later than what Egeria reported, uh, but it, was, uh, it is something that is uh, practiced even to this day. Uh, many of you perhaps have uh, had that kind of experience yourself. And so um, we have the story of Christians wanting to develop or acquire uh, the mindset of Christ. Paul wrote in Philippians 3, I want to know Christ. Once again, I don't want to just know about him. He says, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection, in the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection of the dead. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, we are to acquire the mind of Christ. He says in Philippians 2, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Uh, this is an amazing and audacious uh, claim that an ordinary human, a mortal like you and me, can acquire the mind of Christ. How does this happen? How do you enact the life of Christ across cultures, generations, and time? Well, it seems to be to me to be a developmental process. It's something one does over time through practice, through apprenticeship, through imitation of exemplary behavior. Uh, at the famous uh, scene of the foot washing after it was done, Jesus said to the disciples, I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done. Notice once again, the emphasis is upon practice, upon performance, perform, upon acting out a role. In our day, when you say something is an imitation, you probably mean something that's inferior. Uh, I don't think imitation vanilla tastes as good as real vanilla. Uh, I think an imitation of an original painting isn't worth as much as an original painting. But in the ancient world, the idea of imitation was considered a very positive thing, that if you had a great teacher, if you had a great model or mentor, then it was a virtuous thing to act like them, to uh, follow in their steps, learn their skill sets, as it were, think like them. Uh, and so Jesus says, I've given you an example, do as I have done. And this leads Paul to say later, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. As we enter uh, the events of Holy Week uh, this coming week, uh, perhaps that passage should be in our minds. I am leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. Holy Week is about step by step going through the life of Christ, seeking to acquire the mind of Christ. So how do we learn Jesus? Um, certainly through our study of his life in scripture, through acts of worship, prayer, baptism, Eucharist, and the observances of the Christian calendar. We are entering a period that is called, in the Book of Common Prayer, the proper liturgies for special days, leading from Lent and Ash Wednesday through Palm Sunday, uh, and then on to Monday, Thursday, and uh, Good Friday, and so forth. Uh, if anyone want to be my followers, Jesus said, let them deny themselves and take up their crosses daily and follow me. That's Luke 9.23. And so we have uh, an exciting and momentous and serious week ahead of us as we reenact the story of Christ uh, in, his, in, his, in his passion.
in the liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer, and I encourage you to look at uh, page 287, uh, it's the, in the text we actually uh, talk about our identity with Christ in his suffering uh, uh, on the cross and in the, in the week of, of the Holy Passion. This is the night when you brought our fathers, the children of Israel, out of bondage in Egypt and led them through the Red Sea on dry land. This is the night when all who believe in Christ are delivered from the gloom of sin. This is the night when the Christian, when Christ broke the bond of death and hell. One thing I would encourage you to observe here is in this language, it's present tense language. It's not past tense language. It's not, let's come together and have a week of study of the history of how Christianity came to be. No, this is a week when we re-enter the story in the life of Christ as though it were going on right now. I grew up with certain kinds of hymns. Maybe you knew some of these, like we would sing the old uh, spiritual, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? It's a wonderful hymn because it asks you to re-enter the story as though it, again, is a present day experience. Oh, how I tremble when I go to the cross. Or I think of the Isaac Watts hymn, uh, uh, where uh, Watts describes, again, the crucifixion uh, in the present tense, where he says things like, see from his hands, his hands, his feet, love and sorrow mingled flowing down. So you have an actual picture of that as though a present tense experience. We are entering the story of Christ on the cross during Holy Week. As you uh, look at the, uh, the week ahead, I hope you will consider certain questions um, in your group as you uh, discuss. Let me share a couple of those with you uh, as I conclude. And I think we're about there. Here are some questions that you may want to consider uh, in our lesson on Sunday. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said, every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. Uh, does that statement make sense to you? that your very purpose for being a Christian is to become a little Christ. It is interesting that when Christianity first got a name, it's, a, it's its first name that we know of in history was simply called the way. Uh, you see this in the book of Acts. Uh, the idea that Christianity was a practice, was a way of life. But the second name that was given to Christianity, and it's also in the book of Acts, is they were called Christians first at Antioch. One biblical scholar said once that when you read that word Christian in the book of Acts, uh, you should understand that there was originally a bit of a um, slur implied in that. He said the translation of it might be, they were called the christ likes that a Christian was considered a christ likey <laughs> someone who was acting like Christ, trying to be Christ on earth, which could be mocked by someone who was a skeptic or someone who was not a believer. But the Christians took that label that may have been intended as a kind of slur and said, no, we will wear it. We will be Christians. We will be christ uh, Another In another passage of C.S. Lewis, he says, the purpose of Christianity is Christification being turned into, in other words, little Christ. Uh, does that fit for you or not? Uh, sometimes we talk about the via crucis, the way of the cross, that Jesus walks the way of the cross on Good Friday, but Jesus also says we are to take up our crosses daily and follow him. Uh, perhaps you could uh, have some discussion about what it means to walk the Via Crucis, the, the way of Christ.
And how about this idea from Ephesians 4.20 that we are not just to learn about Jesus, but we are to learn Christ. If it's true that we learn Christ through others' examples, through imitatio Christi, through the imitation of Christ, uh, who in your own life has been that model, that mentor, uh, that uh, example of faith that has helped shape your faith? Paul said quite bluntly, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Uh, who in your own spiritual uh, journey illustrates this imitation of Christ that has been persuasive uh, for you? And as you look over the events of Holy Week, and I hope you will uh, use your Book of Common Prayer and go to those pages uh, around pages 281 and so forth. Uh, as you look through the events that are coming up, uh, especially Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, in the Easter Vigil, uh, which parts of this Holy Week are most meaningful to you, that speak most deeply to your own uh, story, and why is that? Uh, could you reflect on the parts of Holy Week coming up that mean the most to you? And what other spiritual practices might you uh, talk about that have been important in your own spiritual journey? There are many other kinds of spiritual practices that transcend Holy Week. I'm thinking, for example, of pilgrimage. Uh, for th thousands of years now, people go on pilgrimage. I think of the, the Camino de Santiago in Spain, where hundreds of thousands of pilgrims go annually, or at least did until COVID-19 hit, have made that journey, that pilgrimage, uh, to uh, the Church of St. James in Santiago, Spain. Uh, I have friends who've made that pilgrimage, and maybe you have too. Uh, we have cases of people walking the labyrinth. We have at least two labyrinths I know of here in Abilene, uh, one at ECU and one uh, at the Presbyterian Church downtown. Uh, have you ever done the experience of walking the labyrinth, or as we've mentioned earlier, the Stations of the Cross? There are so many spiritual practices that the church has developed, acquired and developed over the last 2,000 years to help you become a christ likey. Which ones of those have meant the most to you? I look forward to our discussion on Sunday. Uh, thank you very much for being with me.